Dr. Sapal Iyer, author of a book titled Aid Dependence in Cambodia, How Foreign Assistance Undermined Democracy, has been invited back to Washington, D.C. to talk about the lessons that Burma can learn from Cambodia during the country's transition to democracy. VOA Khmer reporter's Mike Singh has the interview. Good afternoon, Dr. Iyer. Good afternoon. Welcome to Washington. Um, you will be speaking at a forum in Washington, uh, sharing a lesson that Cambodia has with uh, Burma. So can you tell us what kind of lesson can Cambodia share with Burma? Well, I think uh, Cambodia's experience with foreign aid is one that Burma, uh, Myanmar, will be facing in the coming years, the kind of intensive uh, donor support that uh, sometimes brings with it negative consequences. Um, uh, Burma already has uh, one of the worst rankings in terms of corruption. Cambodia shares uh, these rankings, and I think it's important to see how the effects of a foreign aid mixed in with, <clears throat> with that will have on, uh, on increasing incentives for corruption, incentives for, uh, for, un for sh growth that isn't shared among the people of Burma. Now, turning back to your books, uh, Aid Dependence uh, in Cambodia, uh, you have talked to some observer or analyst who kind of say uh, Cambodia democracy is fading away day by day. And sooner or later, if this trend continues, uh, Cambodia will go away where there's only one party system. So in your opinion, uh, how can we stop this trend or reverse it back to you know, 1993 where they said uh, the democracy at the time was at its peak? Right. So what you've had is uh, not the consolidation of democracy. I would say up until this last election, you saw essentially uh, democracy becoming uh, a, a tool of the ruling party, the use of elections to advance its uh, political agenda and to, it, uh, to consolidate its rule. Uh, but democracy, I think, has had a, uh, ha is not yet dead. And, and in the July elections, the the outcome was a surprise to all, and I think part of that has been because of the demographic shifts in Cambodia. The youth vote made it impossible for uh, the ruling party to take for granted the support that it assumed it would receive from those who remembered uh, how um, the Vietnamese had saved them and, and how, <clears throat> as a result of that, they needed to support the, the ruling party. So I think it's, 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 it's more likely now that um, that there'll be more uh, vocal uh, support for, for mm. opposition views. But at the same time, uh, you know, the ruling party isn't stupid. They're going to uh, adjust in the next election. They're already adjusting their tactics, and they have changed certain uh, uh, ministers in order to accommodate the criticisms of the opposition without, of course, letting the opposition get much of its agenda through, meaning not sworn in, not able to, um, mm. to take positions of power that, that are significant. So still marginalizing the opposition in that sense. And the new government, uh, you might have already known, um, has introduced this so-called deep reform. You think this is going to work uh, the opposition's way or the government way? Well, I think it's, it's, at this point, it's hard to tell. Um, it does, uh, I do worry that it's old wine in a new bottle. Uh, things uh, appear to be different on the surface, but uh, inside uh, the, the method of operating may remain the same, which has to do with patronage and control of electoral politics through resources that then get reallocated to the countryside in order to uh, garner more votes. Um, I, I, I think that it's a good thing that you're changing people who've been there for a long time, but if those people are simply the same old folks who were in the ministry before uh, that were at lower levels but have been promoted, it doesn't mean that you're letting, um, letting change happen uh, on its own in that manner. And on your book, Aid Dependency, uh, now Cambodia uh, government sector has employed around 350,000 uh, workers, uh, mostly uh, uh, women, and also generate around $3 billion annually. So uh, do you think uh, this should be enough uh, for the government uh, to kind of stop, depend on a foreign uh, money and say, okay, uh, donor, let's get out of uh, my way? Well, I think it's, it's clearly not enough. You would need uh, an, another garment sector every 
year to accommodate the number of young people who are turning 18 in Cambodia. So there's, there's never enough uh, employment taking place in Cambodia and to say that uh, the garment sector by itself uh, would suffice is, is wholly inadequate. Um, I also think it's, these are very different things. Uh, one is a sector in which uh, young women typically are working to bring money and, and remit them to the countryside where their parents live and the other has to do with actual development uh, uh, activities in Cambodia. So um, the, real, the real question is China's money in Cambodia making a difference to the point where uh, the Prime Minister can say something like, we don't need your aid anymore, America, mm -hmm. why don't you cut it off already, stop talking about it. Yeah, talking about China's money, in your book you say the arrival of China on the donor stage makes solution even harder to come by. Um, and then your book also argued that uh, in terms of ownership, this government doesn't own that much uh, international money. So don't you think uh, the Chinese money normally come without string attached and it also go to development project like infrastructure proposed by the government? Doesn't it uh, a little bit more than uh, Western money that go to ownership? Well, I think that Chinese money always comes with strings attached. It's just that you don't see the strings explicitly, right? So, so the strings are that then when you chair ASEAN, you're expected to uh, ventriloquate uh, uh, China's position on the South China Sea. Or uh, when Uyghurs try to get uh, asylum in your country, you ship them off on a chartered flight the day before the vice president of China, then Xi Jinping, now president of China, shows up in your country to sign $1.2 billion worth of of, uh, of aid and investment. So I think there's, there's, there are strings. It's just uh, uh, Cambodia has been willing to allow these strings, has been willing to uh, forsake some of its sovereignty and foreign policy in order to accommodate China in exchange for resources, financial resources uh, that uh, it deems uh, worthy. But um, I, I, would th I would think that, that the type of development that takes place from that money isn't necessarily better or you know, isn't focused certainly on governance or human rights, which is, I think, critical for a country's evolution. But also in terms of governance, your book also argued that uh, some development project was actually uh, devised by donor itself and passed on to the government and they just parroted it. And uh, pretend as if it is proposed by the government, that's the reason why there's a lack of ownership. Right. So, if the Cambodian government go with their own project and put back to uh, to request to donor, mm -hmm. will the donor accept that? Well, I think I think the important approach to development needs to be one that is led by people who want to own the development activity, and it's it's it cannot be the donors. They're not the owners of the development activities. They should not be in any case. They're not they're not the ones who live in Cambodia permanently. It ought to be Cambodians, and it ought to be uh, in such a way that. Um, after they've set their priorities, donors should support these priorities. So in Ethiopia, for example, uh, the reputation of that country is very, very much that the government has set up priorities that it wants supported by donors. If the donors come and want to do other things, the Ethiopian authorities will say, thank you very much, we're not interested in that. We want you to support what we're doing. Now, you know, obviously I would hope that with the reforms, the deep reforms being talked about mm -hmm. in Cambodia, that this newfound attitude would emerge uh, in, 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 in Cambodia's approach to its development partners. But we'll, we'll have to see what, whether that happens or not, or whether it'll be more of the same, which is to say, if you have money, you can play, and if you don't have money, you can't play. Also, you talk about um, getting, getting rid of the a gatekeeper of the, inter, uh, the donor money and also improve governance and also uh, get rid of corruption. So these are actually recipe for self-destruction for some ruling elite in Cambodia. Do you think they are willing to do that to kind of killing themselves? Right. So I think the idea there is if, if they act as gatekeepers, say, to globalization, to the ability of the country to bring in technology, the internet and other things in order to profit from, from standing at the gate and preventing it from coming in or letting it in but making them pay for, for it to come in. I would argue that the growth that has been seen in Cambodia, the 10% in the 2000s per year uh, growth uh, in the Cambodian economy, 
could have been much higher had they shared more of it and been less uh, greedy with corruption. So, um, in other words, they can engage in their corruption, but they could engage. They could. They could benefit so much more if they had invested more resources in growing Cambodia's economy equitably. So, infrastructure, health, education. These things can make the can make people add more value in the work that they do, which would then make the economy bigger, which would then allow everybody to win as a result. Okay. Finally, you start your book by talking about your personal story, uh, especially your uh, respected and uh, heroic mother. And you also end your book with uh, your personal hope for Cambodia. Uh, do you think that someday uh, some group of people in Cambodia will stand up, say enough is enough, and uh, let's try a new leadership and be our own boss? Well, I think they've already started to do that with this past election. Uh, they clearly uh, were willing to vote not according to what was expected of them, uh, but of course the outcome has been disputed and it hasn't been settled yet in terms of the opposition's uh, uh, willingness to accept whether the, the vote was 55 seats out of 123 or insistence that it was in fact 63 seats that they won. But I think it's, it's an indication that young people are not tied to the past. They're willing to look at the future and they have been dissatisfied with what's been offered to them and, that, and as a result are standing up for what they consider to be uh, their, their expectations for the future. And, uh, and whether it happens now or happens later, it will eventually happen because nobody lives forever and, control and can rule the country forever. Just, just a matter of time, right? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Ia, for talking to VOA. Thank you.